Hey, everybody, welcome back to Exes for Podcast, the show where we talk about comics, mutant magic, and marvels week after week through their many monthly titles. I'm Nico, and you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Nico Action. That's N I C O A C T I O N. Hi, and I'm Rod. You can find me at Rod, comma, the, on Twitter and Instagram. Hi, I'm Tori. You can find me on Instagram at SMTori and on Twitter at Tori underscore Sheehan. And I'm Jonah. You can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at Peak Jonah. That's P-E-A-K. And we hope you survive this experience just like we hope if you survived an experience with a yokai. Well, okay. That's the best transition because I am, I am bonkers banana pants excited uh, today because, you know, one of the things that makes the Twitter experience really, I think, special for X Twitter is the way creators have made themselves so available. And I don't want to sound ridiculous, but our team is obsessed with Demon Days, number one. X Twitter is obsessed with Demon Days in general. But because it's such a mysterious book, it almost feels mysterious. Like, I can't possibly talk to the people who created it. No. <laughs> and instead, we are lucky enough to have with us today Zach Davison. And we could not be more excited. Zach, thank you so much for being here. Hello. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, I've been on lots of podcasts in my life. Never on an X-Men podcast. So I'm very excited about that, too. Well, nice. we, we are just, it has been so exciting, right? Because like, so Tori isn't as much an avid current X-Men reader, but the minute I opened this, I knew like I had to bring her on. Rod reads literally everything at Marvel, I think at this point. He really yeah. is like <laughs> a, a modern comic historian recording it as it happens. Yeah, <laughs> and, I would have to agree. Jonah, is, Jonah grew up on anime and manga. And, you know, we tried to assemble a team who would really react to this book and then it came out and it happened mm -hmm. and it was so freaking incredible now before we can even get into the magic that is you know mm -hmm. this incredible series i would love to know your journey sort of like what brought you to working on comics what brought you to working with the incredible peach and what ultimately brought you guys to marvel so yeah i mean that's a long story and we'll see what I can parcel through it. So first off, because this is an X-Men podcast, I thought I would establish my credentials because one of the things I've learned doing these sort of podcasts is people need to know that I am someone worth listening to on that topic. So I have a little bit of show and tell here. Ooh. I love this it. Is, <laughs> this is my <gasps> X-Men number one. Shut up! By oh, wow. Stan Lee. Uh, this was my 13th birthday present from my oh, father. Shit. My mother was very angry that he bought it for me at the time. It was quite expensive, but there it is. Oh, wow. Um, this is my <laughs> yeah. X-Men number four. First uh, Scarlet <gasps> Witch. First Scarlet Witch, and, first Quicksilver, yeah, first Quicksilver Brotherhood. Appearance. So <laughs> I have been a comics book fan for a very long time. And for a lot of that time, the X-Men were absolutely my jams. I mean, like, I love the X-Men probably before most of you were born i'm gonna guess um you know uh, yeah so, um, i don't think that's the case so thank yeah. you <laughs> so i'm yeah i'm a long term like i i've been reading comics for as long as i can remember you know it's just one of those things that i you know i started out actually i started out with conan comics was probably my first thing because um i loved conan i loved the books and actually i still remember this because my mother came on this this used bookstore and found like a big box of cheap like a big box of cheap Conan comics for like three bucks or something so she brought it brought it home to me and I just I just fell in love with it I just thought oh these comic things are great and from was there I was the just, black you know, and white mags no like, no it was the it was the Marvel issue so oh, um, awesome yeah yeah but uh um and you know from there I just started branching out and picking stuff up and I eventually you know found my way to to Marvel because Marvel was really my my main thing like I read um I mean, I read X-Men, obviously, because they were brilliant. Um, I, and I liked all the quirky ones. Like, I used to read Defenders. Um, I never really got super into Spider-Man. That's not just, or, or even like any of the big ones. Like, I don't really like Spider-Man. I don't really like Iron Man or Thor. But I always liked the sort of odd parts of the Marvel Universe. And even back then, I mean, the X-Men were never really the, they weren't the big team, you know. Um, they were certainly yeah. secondary to the Avengers and things like that. And that obviously has shifted multiple times over the year. But, um, you know, I have just always loved them. And then, you know, later on in life, I started discovering Japanese comics. You know, they started coming out. Um, I mean, not just growing up myself, watching 
TV shows like uh, Star Blazers and Battle of the Planets. I got really interested in things like Battle that. Battle of the Planets. Oh, yeah. And then, um, you know, slowly, I mean, very slowly, Japanese comics started to be published in English. And that would have been like probably around the mid 80s that that started to happen. And, you know, I got into that. And I just like to me, those two, I think it's one of the weird things about the modern world that to me is strange is that you seem to be either a manga reader or a comics reader. And those two were never separate for me growing up, right? You would go to the comic shop and you would get your manga and you would get, you know, you'd get your, you know, my The Psychic Girl right along with your X-Men and your stack would always have both. That seemed like the normal way to read comics. And so that's how I've always processed them. Like, to me, they're all just comics. I don't really even like the word manga. I use it because I realize it's entered the common parlance that way. But to me, I think it creates an un unnecessary barrier between what a comic is and because they're just comics, you know, all of them. Um, so, you know, I got started getting excited about comics. I, you know, Japanese comics. I started studying Japanese and then um, I didn't learn anything. I mean, I think that was junior <laughs> high because <laughs> Japanese is really hard. I don't know if you've ever tried, but it's ridiculously hard language. Um, I guess so two I, people on the bottom have yeah. tried and you can see <laughs> from the exasperation. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it is. The vast majority of people who start give up I mean they do and that's just normal because it's harder than you think you know it's like it's such a mountain to tackle and that's not anyone's imagination like the the U.S. government actually the U.S. military they classify languages via difficulty and that's basically how many hours it trains to get someone up to the level that they can operate in that language and so they're graded from level one which would be fairly easy for an English speaker to master like Spanish um, up into level five which are the most difficult languages on earth and there are two and only two level five languages on earth. One is Arabic and the other is Japanese. And of those two level five languages, Japanese is starred, meaning that it's slightly more difficult than Arabic. So for <laughs> wow. English speakers, it literally is the most difficult language on earth for, um, for them to master. So it's, you know, if you tried and gave up, forgive yourself because you were trying to climb Mount Everest and that, you know, and understand that. So, uh, you know, and I think I did like a lot of people where I just sort of did it and I drifted in and, you know, I life happened. And I just remember like one day I was sitting at my desk and this I was working at Amazon at the time and I was uh, a training project manager and I was just sitting at a little desk. And I think I just turned like I just turned like 33 and I was just like, is this it? Is this all I get out of life? <laughs> this kind of sucks. I'm just going to sit here in this little cubicle and I'm going to tap on this little computer and I'm just like, and I'm just like, I'm out of here. And so I looked up and I found this thing called the JET program. And the JET program is like, you can go live in Japan and work in Japan for a year. Many um, friends, many friends yeah. did JET. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that sounds way more awesome than sitting here at Amazon. And I'd never been to Japan. And I was like, I was always interested. So I'm like, Screw it. So I quit my job um, at Amazon and I jumped on a plane and flew to Japan. Um, and like many people who intended, like, you know, I don't know, there's certain people who, like I intended to go for a year. I ended up coming back like eight years later. Um, I ended up getting my master's degree over there, um, you know, spent a lot of time in Japan. And just like with Japanese, a lot of people will go and some will, most people will go on jet and they'll return after their year and they had a nice time and it doesn't really affect them otherwise other than they had that nice year. Um, then you have people like me where it entirely changes the course of your existence. Uh, when I was over in Japan also I discovered this manga artist called Mizuki Shigeru and I absolutely just fell in love with his work like just head over heels like I'd never experienced anything before like this in my life and his work was untranslated into English and so um, I just made it like I literally made it my mission to become his apostle and try and get his works into English. I was that serious about him. So I came back to the United States. Oh, and part of the reason why I liked Mizuki Shigeru so much because of his works and why I decided this is that Mizuki Shigeru, he actually he died a few years earlier and he died at 93 years old. And he made his, he was, he, and he is, he is beloved in Japan. It is hard to describe how beloved Mizuki Shigeru is. I mean, he is easily on like a Walt Disney or higher level of um, fame in Japan. He published his first comic book at 40 years old. So his career started at 40. And so that was one of those things where I was just like, I was thinking about to myself. I'm like, well, Zach, you know, you're almost 40. You've always loved comics all your life. You know, why not just try? What is the worst thing that can happen to you if you just try, you know, 
to do what Mizuki Shikita did and start a career in comics at 40. I mean, why not? So um, I did a bunch of stuff that didn't work, like everyone does that when they start comics. I, um, you know, I joined a, a comics website because when you, that's one of the, like the ends into comics is you get a press pass, you start going to conventions and you start making contacts with people and you start, you know, and so I did, I did that route. That was really my route into comics really was a lot of, um, with this stuff, just going to conventions, you know, writing for websites, learning how to process, learning how to think about comics, learning to understand what makes one comic successful or another comic not successful and just trying to think about them other than just as a reader going like, oh, wow. Um, I eventually hooked up with John and Quarterly and they allowed me to publish Mizuki Shige's works with them. And that was fantastic. So our first comic um, that I did with John and Quarterly was Showa History of Japan. who was nominated for an Eisner Award, didn't win, but you know, doesn't matter. It was still awesome. I was in comics now. And that was like the best feeling to know that I now officially worked in comics. Um, and from there, that's really how, I mean, my career has just led to a bunch of different spots you know so like i eventually did i won two eisner awards um working with uh with drawn and quarterly um and then i branched out because i love dark horse comics i just absolutely love dark horse and so i got to know the dark horse crew and then i started um translating satoshi Kon's comics for dark horse and then i started working with other publishers um just mainly doing translation but i also i also write too i mean like translation to me is fulfilling but it's like it's not all I want to do. I always wanted to be a writer translator. That was like my goal. And so I've written my own books as well. And I did, um, I did my own self-published comics with a friend of mine, Mark Morris. And then I met, um, I met Jim Zub and he was doing his comic called Wayward. And so, um, and at the time, you know, Jim was nobody, nobody knew Jim Zub was, you know, he was just a, the guy that did his own little, he did a, self-published comics you know that's what jim's up jim's up did you know that's crazy um, that's really yeah. funny to hear no one knew jim's i'm like that's jim's up <laughs> but i mean but that's that's kind of how these things work like i think one of the most interesting thing with comics and you'll and i give this advice to new people interested in getting into comics all the time is like find your peers who are going in at the same time and then you can all come up together, right? Like if you're like, oh, who should I network with? Oh, I know, I'm gonna go network with Jim Lee. That's not gonna happen now, you know? You wasted your time. But maybe Tori Sheehan down there has an idea for a comic and you're both nobodies. And that way you can work together and learn together and move yourself up to the system. You know, it's just kind of how that works. Tori draws um, my comic. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. No, see, that, is, that is perfect and that is awesome. So. Um, so I started working with Jim Zub on Wayward, and that was that was a like for us that was an amazing uh, hit. Like I remember the first issue of Wayward sold thirty thousand copies, and Jim, where I was just like, oh, I can't believe a comic could sell that many copies. Oh my God, you know, thirty thousand. <laughs> I mean, never had anything close to that level of success before, you know. Um, and you know, and from there, I just started working with other people, and I started tabling on my own because once you have enough um, stock, you go out and you start tabling on your own. And then how I met Peach was essentially the same way. I was at Rose City Comic Con and I was just walking through and I saw there was a Japanese artist. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I went out to talk to her and um, she was there with her husband, Yo, who acts as her interpreter when she's there. And once again, Peach was nobody. Nobody cared. She was like there with her little self-published zine. I actually, I have it over there. I should go grab it and show it to you guys. But yeah, you know, Peach was literally just there with her little self-published zine sitting in a tiny little table, you know, in Artist Alley. Um, and as everyone walked by Peach, you know, but Peach and I started talking and I really liked them both. And I thought she did amazing work. And so we did like, let's stay in touch. And that was the shocking part is that we actually did stay in touch. Cause like 99 times out of a, you know, out of a hundred, you say, let's stay in touch. You're like, yes, let's. And then you both walk away saying, I'll never see that person again, you know? Um, and so Peach and I, over the years, like we've actually tried to do several comics together over the years. We've been like pitching stuff to people, but it's just never really taken off. Like we've had a few people that were interested and then like, mm, maybe not now or maybe later, or, you know, people were pretty laissez-faire about it. We got really close once to doing what I consider to be like one of our dream comics. I can't tell you about it, but I'm always hoping that like now, 
like now that we go back and if we pitch the same comic to the same company i don't think they'll turn us down because you know now it's beach momoko you know <laughs> um, whereas before it was who the hell is this? Uh, so, and then that's been awesome. Like I have loved seeing Peach's star rise. It is so amazing. Uh, she has just been, she's an extraordinary person. She's obviously an extraordinary artist um, and she deserves all of her success. And I think it's been so great. So um, when she got hooked up with Demon Days, it was, you know, so she, and um, I'm not sure, I don't know exactly how the background eventually came, but eventually I just got an invitation in my inbox, which is always funny because you get invitations in your inbox and like, I'm just always wary of stuff that seems too good to be true. You know, someone's like, hey, Zach, would you like to work with Marvel? We can't tell you what it is because NDA stuff. And so you do that and you sign your NDAs and you're like, well, I hope that this is real. Sure would suck if this is a way to scam my credit card or something. <laughs> um, but eventually the mail came through and eventually it was real. And it was, you know, my finally Peach and I got to work on a comic together and it was really great. And, um, you know, they, they started, they hired me at first, like, and I think that the the editor, Lindsay, has been so great to work with because she's just been really flexible about the way we work. I mean, the first time that she hired me, so apparently, uh, I have, I've only met him very briefly, but apparently C.B. Sabolsky like handpicked me and was like, you know, we need to get that guy on this comic with Peach. And so that's how that worked behind the scenes. And Lindsay's like, hey, uh, we're going to hire you. I don't know exactly what you're going to be doing on this comic. And I'm like, no worries you know i will i will come in and figure it out and and because peach and i like we we created a way of working together that i really think is unique i don't know of anyone uh, any other team that works together exactly the same way we do and it was funny when the first issue came back because everyone kept saying you know translation by zach davison translation by zach davison i'm like do none of you people read the credits it specifically doesn't say translation you know um but nobody does read the credits fair so uh we changed the credit for the next issue hoping more people would that that would dispel the idea that this was a translation and oh my god that was so funny because i remember someone posted like this twitter thing where they were like oh you know it's good but it's not as good as the japanese original and i was just dying laughing because i'm like there is no japanese original i mean someone there is just trying to like act like big themselves up by saying that they know some secret and like you don't even know you completely knob wow <laughs> that's is... like the opposite of neil gaiman's dream hunters which mm -hmm. he said at the time was based on a traditional japanese oh, yeah. bit of japanese folklore, folklore. Mm -hmm. and he totally made the whole thing up in a good way but oh it was fantastic yeah spectacular but it, it is not based on a piece of japanese so it's sort of the opposite it's sort of the opposite of that <laughs> oh yeah oh, oh that's amazing now and I think it's still like it's come, it's taken a long time for people to come to grips with the fact that Demon Days is not a translation. I you know, just like, I keep telling this people over and over and over again, like it's not a translation, it's not a translation. And the last round of reviews, you saw more and more people not use that. So I think it's finally sticking in. Good. That's good. <laughs> that is amazing. Now, I, I have to turn the mic over because so many of us have had so many guesses about what things are. I wanted to start with, did anybody have any questions about the characters? Since we're at Demon Days, I, I want to I wanna just ask a few questions about Demon Days straight off the bat. I mean, I know for me, one of the things that was the most exciting was this brilliant reinterpretation of Psylocke as Psy. I thought mm -hmm. the play on her name, the duality of it is clever and nuanced the way she is and to give her this sort of hero's journey and that was something Tori you and I talked about extensively the reimagining of the hero's journey as a non-gendered interpretation of the hero's journey I just I love these character iterations and I would love to know your feelings on them and your guys questions so I mean yeah I'm ha like I can't give away any serious secrets so sadly about that because we've got a lot of cool stuff coming in but yeah, I'm happy to do it. I mean, one of the, I think one of the main things with, with the characters that were chosen, I mean, um, Peach really chose Mariko. And I know because I've talked to her about this, like she chose Mariko because she felt it was a character that she could really make her own. She felt it was a character that she liked, that she um, loved. And Peach had actually done a, uh, like an art card for a trading card set of Mariko at one point in time. And so that was really the foundation of Peach's idea, you know, of love, love for Mariko. 
And so she was like, I can take Mariko and this is basically a blank character and I could do something with Mariko. You know, everyone else is way too established. So that was where, you know, that was where that all started out with. And, um, and like, even with, you know, with Sai and Juju and, you know, all of those characters, like I was just astounded by it too. I remember when I first, when I first heard about it, um, I was a little wary about what would be delivered because one of the things that I think that almost nobody knows about Peach unless you've really followed her for a long time is she is primarily a horror artist. That is what she does. She has always been a horror artist. Her horror art is dark and so disturbing that she had strips rejected from heavy metal magazine for being unprintable. And I know the stuff that was unprintable and it was unprintable. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Peach is- um, Juju's her... mama made, made, made hyper-violent nightmare comics? Oh, oh, beyond, beyond imagining. I mean, like unprintable nightmare comics. And like when I met Peach, like that was what her thing was, right? All of her stuff was just horrible. You know, like um, Shintaro Kago style, if you're familiar with him. But I mean, just like like really body horror stuff as well. Like just, you know, like people splitting apart, you know, body parts everywhere. So this is the Peach I know. I mean, I know that she can do other cartoony stuff and I've seen her evolve. So like, I, to me, Peach has two different styles. She has like the, the cartoony stuff, you know, and then she has the, um, she has what to me is, just, is Peach, you know, just the brutal, violent, gory, um, just harsh horror stuff. Um, so then she's, but she's doing X-Men. Um, and so, and which I think is great, you know, and then she, you know, they send me the first, the first issue to, dialogue and I was just like she just nailed it you know she did such a good job with the characters and she did such a good job interpreting everything and yeah so but yeah by all means I don't want to just blather all the way chat throw me characters hold on I would love actually let me just I'm going to step away from my camera for like two seconds see if I can see the self-printed zine and then you can see what what Peach's artwork looks like it's amazing so, cool. <laughs> right here <laughs> I can still hear you, by the way, because I'm on my head. It's, it's, just so, it's so interesting to me with these characters because it sort of sounds like something that Nico and I would get up to at two in the morning where we're like, okay, but what if these characters are secretly all of these characters in the Powerpuff Girls? And for it to just come out like this and something so beautiful and so amazing, um, you know, was that was that sort of what she was originally deciding upon that she really wanted to kind of transpose? I think I don't know. See, I don't know that she put that much thought into it. You know, honestly, I've seen her character designs, and also I will say that um, that CB Sabolsky also did a really good job of um, like he's a great guider of talent. Um, and what I, so this was another interesting thing that Peach did is that she auditioned for Demon Days by writing Demon Days. She created a fully painted comic and sent it into Marvel as her audition. I mean, it was crazy because no one really trusted Peach to be able to do sequential art. You know, mm -hmm. she was a fine coverist, but they didn't know that she could do sequential art. Um, and as far as her character design, I mean, she wants, she brings in a lot of elements that are just pure Peach as well. Like the um, like the bone armor for Mariko and a little what she calls the point point care. She's been doodling that in her sketchbooks since high school. I mean, these are literally just elements oh, of wow. design that she has just been creating over and over again. And so she finally gets the chance to bring these into a, a published product. You know, she just has tons and tons of sketches of um, of just little you know all of these details. And so it's really like it's really just a, an accumulation, I would say, of of what, how you see Peach's imagination, you know, what she thinks things should look like. Um, I did find it. So this is my first experience with Peach. This is, I don't know if you're going to want to blank this out for your podcast. That is Cannibal Breakfast, I believe it is called. Oh my God. Oh, Cannibal, <laughs> Cannibal Supper. Oh, um, I love it. Oh, yeah. I love this. <laughs> It is so, so cool. Um, there's some more that are a little maybe not so safe for work. But yeah, I mean, so yeah, this is, like I said, <laughs> this is the Peach that I've always known. Um, huh. 
And so it's been so amazing to see, to see the other side of her, you know, to see all this, like this little, but then she's also done that. And I thought that was really great too, is she also, um, you could see more of her, her natural horror elements coming in, especially in Mariko, right? So mm -hmm. you see more of the body horror stuff coming in. Um, like, like when Mariko coughs up the key, right? That was just like, I'm like, oh, that's Peach right there. You know, something that makes you really uncomfortable just to view is what um, reminds me of Peach's art. Yeah. Was there a certain amount of pulling back uh, for some of her choices to be safer for an X-Men title? You know, honestly, our editor has let us do pretty much whatever we want to. Um, Amazing. So I think, yeah, I think that from the start, uh, they just kind of gave Peach free reign. And I think that, you know, from it's also a level of just gaining confidence on Peach's side. You know, she's done like sort of like they should like the first one with um with a juggernaut and Emma inside, like that little 10 page preview, you know, it's a, it's a little safe, you know, piece. But then as she as each issue comes along, it's just really amazing to see how she sort of like matures in the story. And it's, you can see that she's bringing more of like um, her, you know, like elements of her voice instead of trying to like make like what's a good you know, Marvel comic, more like what's a good Peach comic that happens to be published at Marvel, I would say. Mm. Nice. Hmm. Yeah, there, let me say, there's some parts in Cursed Web that are, that are Peach. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Like, oh. Well, and I yeah. Oh, no, please, you go. Please, please. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know she was like that at all. It doesn't make sense now seeing um because i saw recently i didn't know she had them but i was researching covers and something mm -hmm. is killing a children cover and department of truth cover she did those covers and they are very like the art you just showed us because those mm -hmm. are that those are very horrific books um and i was like oh this is new for peach i never seen this and apparently no that's her no that's style. her old style yeah that's so. her old style yeah and i still think i mean i still think of peach as primarily a horror artist honestly mm -hmm. um we, in fact, what, we, when uh, James Tinney and Didis did his um, horror series, Razor Blades, uh, I don't know if you guys read that at all, but, you know, mm -hmm. we were going to do something for that. But one of the unfortunate things about Peach being on a Marvel contract, which is both awesome for her and also sad, means we can't do anything else that's sort of like fun and extra. But, you know, that's just for now. So, How did you guys get permission to use Natasha? Like, they, so, that's that's been on my mind because, like, my, I, I'm, I'm perhaps a bit of a Wolverine guy, so mm -hmm. I, perhaps, perhaps a Wolverine guy. I love Logan so <laughs> much, and I love Mariko so much, and I'm like, I kick everything, and I'm like, okay. I wonder because Natasha and Logan, they have that amazing backstory moment. Mm -hmm. X Men two sixty eight, you know, oh, yeah. Claremont really killing it on that story, that perfect Captain America cameo, and I, other than that, there's not a lot of uh, binding ground between Natasha and the X-Men. So like, this was a veritable feast of mm -hmm. Natasha excellence in X-Men. Was there some process that you guys had to go through to get her? No, to be honest, one of the joys of working in a non-continuity comic is you're, you've got a lot of freedom. You know, if you're working in an AU comic like Demon Days, you can pretty much do what you want because it is of no consequence, right? So we can have Natasha in there. Um, we can have basically anyone we want in there. I mean, there's, we have a lot of characters coming up in the next issue that you're going to be, I think, pretty surprised by, um, especially because I heard your previous podcast about it. And I'm like, oh, we've got surprises coming up for you. We just um, aren't sure who the last person <laughs> is. <laughs> that was my question. That was so good. Was so who good. is it? Who is it? Tell us. Can you I tell can't, us? I can't. I okay. Can't so it's okay. not been publicly released. Okay. Yeah. So we're not in the dark any more than anybody else is in the dark. Mm -mm. Yes. Demon days um, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, but once again, that's one of the joys. Like I, and I love non-continuity stuff. Like I honestly, like, like I have dropped out of X-Men for God, I don't know, decades now because I read X-Men up to a point to where it changed and it was no longer my X-Men. And that was, that was fine because it was a new generation's X-Men. And, um, I think that's a great thing about it, especially continuity comics is like, you know, stuff that speaks to you up to a time and then it, it moves on to speak to a new generation and it no longer speaks to you. And to me, I think that's great. Um, I was happy to pass the torch to a new generation. So I haven't read X-Men for, gosh, I think I dropped off at about issue probably 
300 or so around there, you know, um, so somewhere around there. A lot there. has yeah. changed. Right. And that was one <laughs> of the good things about doing once again an AU series is that it's all characters I recognize. It's and Peach is the same way. She likes the sort of like classic X-Men, you know, she likes the classic characters. So she's bringing in really um, she's not really bringing anyone obscure. Um, there was one character she brought in that I didn't know who it was. And so I had to look that up. Uh, but for the most part, you know, she really, she's like my, my era, you know, she likes those, those classic X-Men. I was surprised that she, in the first book, the Demon Days, that she brought in Danny Moonstar as a little girl. Oh yeah. And I was, was it because that she does the bow and arrow? Was that like the, the reason or was there like a more significant reason on why? She just liked the bow and arrow. Um, I okay. think that's, <laughs> like, like, cause that's one of the conversations that we have a lot internally is how beholden are we to the characters as they are versus how can we just make something entirely new mm -hmm. and the answer is really um you know there's there's a magic middle there right um the characters can be entirely new but if they go so far that readers no longer accept that as the character um then i just think that's too far so we're always trying to find that that middle balance you know we're always trying to find like where how far can we take this character i think like kuya um our nightcrawler is a really good example of that right he is just he is he is his own thing um and he was he was really uh funny too because that's one of my problems also is because when i first start dialoguing the books i tend to dialogue them like the x-men i know um and so nightcrawler <laughs> pops up and he's cracking jokes and he's doing you know his nightcrawler thing and peach peach sees what i wrote and she's like no this isn't, <laughs> this isn't my nightcrawler my nightcrawler doesn't talk and i'm like well he's got to talk a little peach you know and um and and so, but but i love but i mean but that's her interpretation of the characters it's like you know this really like silent sort of ominous figure you know and i'm like and so, you know, and like, but that's always, that's what like I said, that's one of the funnest ways that we work together is there's a lot of this back and forth. There's a lot of me sort of processing what I know is the classic version of these characters, their own voice and dialogue versus Peach's interpretation of them and trying to find, I think, that real middle ground. I'm very, I'm very happy and I am proud of my um, sticking the BAM there in the second <laughs> issue. Uh, yes because that was originally not in there also. And our letterer, Ariana, who's also a good friend of mine. And um, a good friend of ours. We love her. We, we, oh, are, nice. we are big fans. We've had her on yeah. the show. We think the world yeah. of Ariana. Ariana Mar, she wants yeah. it said like Boston, Mar. Yes. A Ariana, yet another person who um, just, I met her at Rose City Comic Con. I mean, Rose City Comic Con in Portland is really the convention that spawned Demon Days because that's where all of us met. But, you know, when I met her, she was actually way higher up in comics than I was. Um, and now we're all working on Demon Days together. So it's just been, uh, it's been a magical, I don't know, magical experience. There's a lot of good zeitgeist that happens there. But I got to, I got to give Ariana her first BAM to let her. So she was very excited about that. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, something I would love to know for these stories, mm -hmm. do is the story, like the plot and the elements created first and then the characters, you find the characters that you can use and stick them where they are, or do you choose the characters first and figure out how can you fit them into a narrative in a story? Definitely the plot first. Definitely. Um, so Peach has, Peach has all of it plotted out. And then, you know, she has characters she wants to use because she likes them or she likes their design or for whatever reason. She also has certain characters that she thinks make nice avatars for various Japanese characters. And so she uses them that way. But the entire series is all plotted out. And the basic process, so like it'll be plotted out. And then um, Peach will, you know, work with Lindsay, our editor, and they will get the, you know, the sort of like rough sketch version. And then that's what I get sent. So I get sent this sort of like, rough really rough pencil sketch version of the comic and then i go in and i dialogue the whole thing um and so i put in basically if anyone's copying that's me that's my addition to the comic because most of the um the other stuff i get from Pete. i mean she will add in sample dialogue sometimes like she'll do like stuff like you know like oh i want this person to say here where, where it's really important but for the most part it's just um just blank pages of art it's almost like the old traditional marvel, marvel method style. Of, yeah. yeah marvel style where you get the art and then someone else goes in and dialogues it love it uh we actually had uh jay ferber who worked on gen x in the 90s as well as the, oh, nice. 
uh, third run of New Warriors in the mm-hmm. late 90s. And he also did a big run on Titans. And we had him on and he was saying that uh, there was an issue where we we're like, no, we have to know were you credited as co-storytellers here because blah, blah, blah. Or why did the credits change? And he was like, they must have changed the credits that week. <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. And he was yeah. like, we all just did Marvel Method. It was just mm-hmm. Marvel Method back then. So yep. somebody just changed the credits without you. <laughs> this is what it is, man. Yeah. yeah, and even like like and even like even the traditional Marvel Method, because definitely like there's a difference between the traditional Marvel Method and how Peach and I do it, is that, you know, we will, Peach and I will then work together to finalize the dialogue. So it's not like, like I get the art and I just dialogue it and she's stuck with whatever I dialogue. You know, that is definitely not it. You know, if I do something that Pete's really doesn't like, which has absolutely happened. Um, the two of us will talk it over. And sometimes my idea gets in and sometimes Pete's idea gets in. And I think that the final product is always better. Like when I actually see the printed page, I'm like, oh, I'm really glad that we went with Pete's, you know, version there because it's just better. And then there's other stuff where I'm like, oh, I'm really glad that I went with mine because yeah, so. But it's like this whole process of collaboration, which is one of the best parts about it. But again, I think it's pretty unique to comics. I don't know anyone else that works that way. Now, and what... it, yeah, as, as far as credits go, I mean, that's such a, because you're right about that. It's like, what do we get credited as? You know, I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, people are like, like Marvel has me on their website as a co-writer, but then inside the credits, it's listed as, dialogue you know because that was part but there's also like a lot of um legal aspects that come into pay and like you know when you credit someone as something officially all these like you know hr gets involved and so we kind of just like i don't know man let's just find something that kind of works and yeah now i I do have to ask a little bit of a question because you know the tradition of the beautiful infusion of eastern ideas into western comics Mm -hmm. goes back you know as as far back as it is comics almost at this point you know Mm -hmm. one of the things i really loved now the man is of questionable content these days but frank miller's 70s and 80s work so influenced my understanding of eastern comics so Mm -hmm. so thoroughly you know tori and i share such a a brilliant passion for classic miller and jansen daredevil electra and i know his work on ronin is his work on Ronan changed my life. You know, it, mm-hmm. it changed how I saw comics and that Claremont sought with Miller to create, and then later on with Sal Buscema, uh, that they sought to create between Wolverine and Kitty Pride and Wolverine, sort of a Japanese allegory through American comics was a really mm-hmm. important thing to me growing up to help me understand things like Sailor Moon, which I loved, but I didn't always understand exactly. Like there were conventions of Sailor Moon. Tori, something that I really appreciated that you brought to the episodes is a little more understanding of conventions of, of perhaps some of the storytelling modes. And I, I know that the story is truly, it reads different than an American comic in so many ways. It has unique pacing and unique beats in a way that helps me understand the medium a little bit better. Because mm-hmm. now I can see these differences. Mm-hmm. I can read the pacing and the stylization. And I found it just really transformative as a work in that regard. Is there some methodology you guys are doing to keep the voice so pure and maybe free of influence of modern comics? I mean, I think that it's like the methodology is just letting letting us do our job and letting us produce what we want to produce. I mean... Part of that is obviously, once again, going to be Peach because the pacing in the comic is very traditional to her pacing. And I think also even the dialogue of the comic, you'll find that because I come from a background of manga translation, and so I tend to not be very wordy like an American comic because I tend, like my ability, my idea of good dialogue has been shaped by manga. And so I believe in the very much a less is more um, theory of dialogue, you know, and I think you'll see, so I do think you'll see those two influences combining, but it's interesting because, you know, Peach has always primarily wanted to work in American comics. I mean, there's a reason why I met her at Road City Comic Con. I mean, she got on a plane and flew all the way to Portland to Artist Alley in America, because those are the comics she wanted to work on. She wasn't interested in becoming 
a manga artist, you know, working on Japanese manga. She wanted to work on American comics. So um, she brings that love of American comics, which I think is really her, you know, that's her heart and soul um, more than anything else. I, I bet if you ask Peach, like she would probably love, you know, I don't know, Mystique far more than Sailor Moon, you know, because those are what she fell in love with. And probably in, you know, I mean, in the same way as, as everyone else, you know, you'll have certain Americans that grow up and they fall in love with, you know, Japanese comics. And of course you have Japanese people falling with American comics. Of course you do. And that's really, you know, Peach's background, you know, that's why she came over here. Um, so like, but, but she also carries those cultural standards with her so when she's creating her own comics, right? So it does have that blend, but it's, it's almost like, it, I think Peach's art reminds me a lot like, um, uh, well, maybe not her art at all, but this is going to be a strange analogy, but Akira Kurosawa is very famous as making the most Western Japanese films ever made, right? There's a reason why Americans all love Kurosawa. And it's because he was specifically trying to make American movies and not Japanese movies, right? He was attempting to imitate Western pacing, Western conventions, American film styles, but he could not take the Japan out of himself. And so you end up with this mixture that is almost more palatable to American readers because it is a, it's a fusion that they can recognize. So they can recognize parts of it, but they can also recognize the parts I think that are subtly different as you know, as well. So that's my that. answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved your comment though, by the way, about American comics and Japanese comics, uh, you know, because once again, like I said, you know, they didn't used to have that split, right? And most Japanese comic artists absolutely love American comic artists, right? They study their work, you know, I mean, of course they do. And most American comics artists love Japanese comic artists. You know, there's a mutual admiration society going on there. Like I remember, um, well, I wasn't there, but one of my favorite stories is that uh, when, when uh, Osamu Tezuka, who is one of the most famous comic artists in all of Japan, he did uh, uh, Astro Boy, he's, he's known as the god of manga in Japan. So he came over to San Diego Comic-Con uh, as, as a special guest one year. Um, this was, I think, I forget what it was. It was either, I think it was either early 80s or, uh, I mean, way, way before my time of ever going to San Diego Comic-Con. And the one thing that he wanted, and I know this because I'm friends with his interpreter at the time, Fred Schatz, like Tezuka came in, he's like, I'll go, but I get to meet Jack Kirby. Right. That was the thing that Tezuka wanted to do more than anything. He's like, I'll come, but I get to meet Jack Kirby. Um, and so Tezuka went over to Kirby's house with Fred Schatz acting as their interpreter. Um, wow. Yeah, because they once again, they have always they, they've always admired each other and they still do. Um, and that's another thing I love about Demon Days. I think it's great. I want more people to understand that the mixture of the two can be something special, that they don't really have, they're not separate swim lanes, you know, they, and they don't have to be separate swim lanes, you know, that if you enjoy comic books, if you enjoy the medium of comics, you know, you should be taking from all of what the medium has to offer rather than just be hyper-focused on one thing. That's actually an amazing story from Jill Thompson as well. Jill Thompson, famous uh, artist from The Invisible, oh, yeah. Sandman, and... I'm, I actually have a Jill Thompson and, hanging in my office. And, and Beast of Burden, which is one of my all-time favorite comic series. So. Yeah, and yeah. she's had such an incredible career. And mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a baby Morpheus of the Little Endless hanging in my office by her. And I am also a little obsessed with her husband, Brian Azzarello. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm hanging at her table and she's drawing me this Morpheus. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's the, what's the craziest story you never get to tell? And mm -hmm. she was like, you know, I think it would have to be Alex Ross didn't believe in anime and manga and she just keeps drawing and I'm like what in God's name do you mean and she's like he said that he didn't think they were that different in art form I mean they're the same art form but yeah they're different and she's just drawing so casually this whole mm -hmm. time and she's like so I made him read some manga no big deal and uh, Alex Ross came back up to me and he was like I get it now <laughs> <laughs> It's like one of those moments that will never leave me. <laughs> it's just Jill Thompson just being so mm. chill, talking about teaching Alex Ross how to manga. And I was just like, this is this is one of those stories. It's like it's hearing those two men sitting in a room. And if I were your friend, the interpreter, I think I mm. would have just passed out. 
Well, let me tell you, Fred, Fred Schatz is a legend in his own right. He's actually been decorated by the Emperor of Japan. So um, he's, wow. he's, yeah. That was, a, that was a meeting of three titans, not two. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Um, but yeah, no, and I, I like, I love that story about Jill Thompson too, because I, and I encounter that a lot with people when I try to talk, and that's, you know, that's something I talk about all the time too, is people are like, well, I don't really like manga, and I don't like the style, and I'm like, what style? Manga has thousands of artists, and of those thousands of artists, they each have a style, so when you say what style, you're generally, it's because you've got this stereotype idea in your head of what manga is and most of those people have done it have never really approached it because the more you read it the more you understand that it was like you know some this person's style like gotanabe style is a hundred percent different from someone like mizuki shigeru's style which is just night and day from you know horikushi style i mean there there is no such thing as a manga style per se i love that i love that because i don't know I haven't been on the manga in a while, but I used to be a big manga reader, mm -hmm. like, our, you know, Japanese comic book reader. And I I never really, I didn't know, I, I've seen recently that there's been a riff between the two, like you said, but I never really considered that. I always disliked both and I always got both. Like I got the mm -hmm. American comics and Japanese comics as well. And I wanted to ask you, I know you've kind of said it already, but I mm -hmm. wanted like clear cut list or maybe for you to explain on it. What are some of your favorite like Japanese novels that you've like modern and older, just like a list? If you like could... novels or comics, which ones? Oh, both, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I guess, I, I mean, guess, I, I guess mostly comics, but yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I certainly know comics. Okay, more than anything. I, I just use the word comics all the time yeah. to mean many, many, I, I love the catch-all of comics. It's actually one of the interesting things about uh, manga and comics is that, and this was a surprise to me, is that when you, uh, like the word manga means something completely different in Japanese than it means in English. Um, we have basically took the word and we made a new meaning for it. Manga just means the vast world of comics, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So like, if my wife comes out and she sees me in the living room and I'm reading like a 1940s Captain Marvel adventure comic, she'll be like, you know, put down your manga and go clean the house or something like that. That is manga, you know. Um, just the other day when the, the new The Suicide movie came out, the Suicide Squad movie came out, and I was like, hey, hey, honey, do you want to watch The Suicide Squad? She's like, well, I'm not really in the mood for manga because that is, once again, from a Japanese person's point of view, manga. It's all manga. Um, and I tend to use, and when you actually go to a Japanese bookstore and you go to the comic section of like the manga section of a Japanese bookstore, they will have a sign up and that sign will say in Japanese, comics. So they mm -hmm. actually use the word comics in Japanese um, for what we use, yeah, the word manga for. So that's always been kind of funny. I mean, my favorites change on a really like regular basis. I'm, I tend to like, stuff I grew up with, which makes me old and I get that, but like, you know, uh, Matsumoto Leiji's uh, Captain Harlock is one of my favorite comics of all time. I absolutely adore Shizuki uh, Mizuki Shigeru's work. Like it is just my heart and soul. And I think that of all my contributions to comics, I think that my translation of Showa History of Japan is the one like it, it will live beyond me. It will be, you know, it's a part of world literature. Um, I really like Oh gosh, who else do I like? I love Gotanabe's work. If you've ever read, um, he does these amazing H.P. Lovecraft uh, comics, which I honestly think are not only the best H.P. Lovecraft comics ever made, I honestly think they are the best H.P. Lovecraft adaptations ever made in any medium. Really? Uh, yeah. I'm currently obsessed with this comic called Midnight Diner uh, that I absolutely love. And it was, there was a Netflix TV show that was based off the comic. And the comic is just like, I love it so much. I'm trying so hard to get, like whenever I get obsessed with a comic, I try to find some comic company that will publish it for me, but I haven't had any success so far, but it is just wonderful. Um, I mean, like other stuff, like, like I love this comic called Outlanders, which is long lost to obscurity, but Outlanders was my very first tattoo. So my very first tattoo was an anime girl from this comic called Outlanders. Um, nice. I love everything by uh, Maru, uh, Rumiko Takahashi. Like, uh, Masonic Koku is just my absolute dream. I love Masonic Koku. I love Lum. Um, 
those are both just magnificent, magnificent comics. But again, my tastes tend to run old. So almost everything I've said here is from either the 80s or the 70s. Um, of modern stuff, I've been reading a comic called uh, Tokyo uh, Tadadeba Girls, which is really fun. And what's one of the things that I like about manga, and you do find this variety in Western comics as well, but you just don't find as much variety. And part of that's because of marketplace, right? Japan has a vast, far more robust marketplace of comics than America does. And so comics there, can be financially successful that are not would never be financially successful in the United States because they're far too niche. Like that's one of the things um, a friend of mine, Adam Warren, will often say is that Adam Warren he considers Japanese comics to be er comics. Like they are the they are what when you when you say what actual comics are, that's manga, and then everything else is basically a subcategory of manga because in sheer volume and style and everything like that, that is true. And so Tokyo uh, Tadareba is just basically about three 30-year-old women who um, have come this far in life and they're suddenly feeling that, you know, they haven't gotten married and, you know, and they're stressed out. It's basically the stress of approaching middle age and not really being happy where you are in your life and the choices you've made and what you do with that. And it's really funny and it's really comedic and I just absolutely adore it. It's, you know, it's so fun to read but also has a lot of heart to it. And a lot of people will relate to it in a, you know, in that way that they will also find themselves in their thirties and examining their life. And I think that's a thirties thing to do, right? You get into your thirties as I did, right? I'm 33 and I'm looking at my desk at Amazon and I'm like, is this all I get? Right. And so there's an entire comic series about that called Tokyo Tadareba Girls um, about that feeling of, is this all I get out of life? So I've been really enjoying that. Um, the comic series Delicious in Dungeons, I also absolutely adore. It is hilarious. It is weird. And it is, one again, showcases one of those things I love about manga. So it's, I don't know if you guys, have you guys heard of this at all? No, Probably not. That's but fine. I'm very interested. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Delicious in Dungeons is basically a Dungeons and Dragons themed comic about this group that goes into the dungeon and they run out of food and they killed some monsters. And so one of the team members is like, could eat the monster and they're all a little bit freaked out on it but then they kill them they kill and cook the monster and they like it and so then the comic becomes basically this food tour of dungeoneering as they go through and kill various monsters <laughs> and they have to like debate with each other about like well they don't want to eat the ones that are too humanish like we don't want to eat orcs because that's kind of gross and like one of my favorite scenes is that they kill a mermaid and um, there's one guy that's super into eating the monsters. And there's another person at the party who's like, no, she's way too human. We can't eat the mermaid. He's like, like problem solved. Takes off his sword, chops her in half, grabs the tail part. It's like, well, we can eat this then as long as we don't eat the head part. And it's, just, it's really funny. I uh, so, love that. <laughs> yeah. So there's a list of some of my favorites. I mean, there's just so much to explore. Um, I, just, I mean, I have a Kindle. And one of the great things about the modern age is that you can just... I mean, you used to be able, like, you used to be able to under read Japanese manga. You had to like order them and wait months to ship them over, and shipping was mm -hmm. insane. And now I can literally just go on my Kindle and be like, boop, 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 and it's just, it's great. I See, love the modern comics world. I've never read a manga on Kindle. I don't know how I would feel. I've only done paper. Oh yeah, <laughs> I actually yeah. Th I think it's really suited. Um, I think it's actually I think manga on Kindle is actually better than most Western comics on kindle uh because western comics are often especially western superhero comics are often enamored of the double page spread which is awful on kindle like a double page spread is so bad on kindle um but japan doesn't really use double page spreads in fact yeah. actually now that i think about it, that's another i don't think we've ever had a double page spread in demon days and i think that oh, that's yeah. possibly also indicative of that you know that big western idea that you turn the page to bam is not something that you find so much in manga because each page you know it's just it's a little smaller maybe a little like more considered story um although that's not true if i think about it like like big comics like akira will probably have double page spreads mm. but it's not it's not as common because you're not going for grand scale necessary right you're like even in, like in Demon Days, like I don't think our scale is very grand. I think that all of the stories are quite intimate. You know, they're really about the people involved. And I think that the most grand scale image we ever got to do was Venom inside the temple. Um, you know, that was like, that was it. That was as grand an image as we'll put in 
in all of Demon Days. But you the rest were all of it was really... pretty nuts about that image. Yeah. Yeah. That, that yeah you like that? That was amazing. I love Venom. So, yeah. <laughs> that but was I... my, that, I love that image because I got to use it to show, like, you can show what each person adds to Demon Days from that, right? So, the original picture is just Venom. And then I added the special effects. I'm like, well, there's got to be sound here. So, I added the, s- and then I handed that off to Ariana and she turned my, s- into something phenomenal and which i knew ariana would do and i often say that to ariana i'm like i'm just gonna put this little note here do something cool with it and yeah so that main image is basically it's you could it's where you can see the partnership of the three people who make demon days that's amazing perfect thank you so much for telling me about all that manga now i'm, I'm sure oh, my yeah. fiance is gonna hate that but now i'm gonna <laughs> when this video comes out or the audio and anything i'm gonna rewatch this and write all of it down and go yep. read it because I haven't I, read yeah. anything since like Death Note and Vampire oh, Night, yeah. which is very basic. It's very mainstream, but I loved it. <laughs> I mean, and there's nothing wrong with basic or mainstream. I mean, one of the one of the greatest things about the world of comics now is I truly do it. As someone who's been reading comics from the 70s, I truly feel like we are in a comic golden age. I think there's more great comics out now than has, there has ever been in the history of the medium, you know, uh, and it's just it's really a question of how much time do I have? And that's the sad part. Cause I don't even get to read all the great comics out there. And, you know, like manga, there's just so much, there's so much to explore. So I highly encourage everyone to just like find something that you think is awesome, you know, find something that works for you or speaks to you. Cause I guarantee there's, there's something out there. So I do have to ask a couple mm-hmm. of silly questions. Do it, Normally yeah. we ask about people in the, you know, we ask our, our writers or creators mm-hmm. to weigh in on the Krakoan age of comics. But, you know, you've, you've stepped away a bit from mm-hmm. X-Men. So yeah. I kind of have to ask. We can it, bring it back, yeah. Well, I've asked a different, pretty <laughs> standard, mm-hmm. you know, if we're mm-hmm. going to switch to anime, I have to know. Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle? See, Who's now your you'll... starter? Now you'll get me because I don't play video games at all. Like, <laughs> at all. There's, I, there's Pokemon too. manga. The Pokemon yeah. manga is really good, actually. Um, I was... <laughs> yeah. So I, <laughs> I don't play video games and I almost never watch anime. I am a comics guy through and through. And every time that I feel like I have time to do something, because I, I just, I don't know, I'm really busy. And anytime I have time that I take to myself, I, to me, there's no better way to spend that time than comics. And so, you know, uh, um, my, my favorite Pokemon, I've actually got a few hanging around here, is definitely those Jigglypuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and as much as I love Jigglypuff, a lot of it has to do, my love of Jigglypuff has to do with the old cartoon from the 90s where they used to do, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but they have these, um, these Batman the Animated Series. They used to do these little advertisements. The, commercials. the yes. little commercials, right? And my favorite commercial that always cracked me up is like, because they would basically redub the scenes. And so, you know, like Robin's in bed and Batman's there and Robin's like, I can't sleep, Batman. He's like, go to bed. It's like, do it, Batman. And Batman's like, sigh, a leap Yes, I remember. <laughs> I remember these. Off, right? yeah. <laughs> so, Golden age. Yeah. Oh. So that's why I love Jigglypuff. <laughs> That is, there is no better reason to love a Pokemon than Batman right? <laughs> openly impersonating it to help his bi child go to sleep. So, exactly. <laughs> I would suggest reading the original Pokemon manga, though. It's good. I have, I, I have read it. It's been a long time, but I've read, I've read a couple volumes of it, I think. Yeah, okay, but it's cool. been a long time. <laughs> so, I want to make sure that if anybody has any remaining questions, Jonah, Tori, Rod, if you guys have any questions, I want to make sure you guys get those in. Well, I was going to ask about Yokai Watch, which is basically Pokemon with Yokai. Right? I know. I know. Oh. I'm such a disappointment sometimes when I realize that they <laughs> want to talk about games. And I'm like, I don't play games, you know? Sorry. That's absolutely I, yeah. fine. <laughs> um, I do actually have a question about translation stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and my question is about when you have to translate comedy, if mm-hmm. you've ever had to, what is kind of like the process of that? Because I know there's so much that can oh there's so many differences between mm-hmm. different cultures of what is comedic and what isn't and a lot of stuff like and i would just love to know like what that process uh, is like it is, it is the worst it is the worst <laughs> there there's a reason why you see so few 
uh, com comedic works in translation, right? You don't see a lot of comedy movies. You don't see a lot of comedy manga because you are spot on, right? Comedy is almost 100% linked to verbal and cultural aspects, right? There's very little in comedy that does not rely on one of those two things. And I only did one comedic book I did, and I, it was kind of funny. So I did, I did Panty and Stockings with Garter Belt as my one comedic book I did. And I did it, <laughs> I did it specifically because my, my editor, Carl Horn at Dark Horse, because I had just translated Mizuki Shigeru's biography of Adolf Hitler. And he's like, I thought it would be funny to say from the translator of Adolf Hitler, of Hitler's biography comes Panty and Stockings with Garter Belt. So it was like, that was, he just, it amused him to, to give this comic to me. Because I had always done these like really like sort of heavy and like sonorous important works, you know? And so Pan Panty and Stockings with Garter Belt was my first ability to like sort of move on to that and try and flex a different muscle. But I'm like, uh, it is really hard. In fact, it is it is almost you you can only do one thing successfully, I think, which is basically to rewrite it entirely in English because mm -hmm. jokes as written in Japanese are simply not funny in English. They are not funny at all. Um, you know, like like you know, as I as I explained to some of my because the Japanese jokes are often based on puns, you know, um, just like American mm. jokes are. And so you know, there'll be like my wife and I will just kill each other laughing with jokes like, shall we have, you know, ginger pork tonight? And my wife will say, alas, we have no ginger. And that will just crack us up because in Japan, that is a very funny pun. Um, <laughs> sure. Right, exactly. But you translate that into English and it makes no sense. Nobody's laughing on that. Um, and, you know, and that's one of the things I think that people misunderstand about translation is that when you're, when you're doing a translation, and once again, just to reconfirm that Demon Day is absolutely not a translation, because people get confused about that. But when you're doing a translation, what you do is you translate the emotions, not the words. Like, the words themselves, like, what purpose do words, words serve, right? Words exist to transmit ideas and emotions. And most of the time when I'm transmitting words, and especially as a writer, I want to invoke emotions from my reader, right? So I want you to laugh here. I want you to be moved here. I want you to be, you know, scared here. Or I want you to, your heart race to go up here, right? That's the, that's the point. That's what the author is trying to get at. And whatever words you need to bring to the table to get that emotion, then those are the words that you serve. You're, uh, frankly, a bad translator if all you do is translate the words. If all you do is look at the words and, like, says, and you take the joke, you know, shall we have ginger pork for dinner tonight? Alas, we have no ginger. Like, if you put that on the page, then you, you failed as a translator. Um, so what you would try to do is try to figure out something similar you know, because what is the situation? It's a husband and wife in the kitchen. They are telling dorky jokes to make each other laugh. And so you think of a dorky joke to, that people would tell, and then you just write a brand new joke. Um, you completely ignore what the author wrote. And, you know, if, if you're good at it, you could pull off some pretty clever stuff, you know, like still maybe make it food related, um, make it situational and things like that. Uh, and that's and that's what actually you'll find that a lot, especially on Twitter, that a lot of people, you know, because people will come in with like first year Japanese and then they'll look at this and they'll be like, this word is not this word. You have made a mistake as a translator. And that's a first year Japanese person's approach. Right. I did the same thing when I had a year of Japanese under my belt. I was like, I know more than the translator because I can clearly see that this word here is not this word. They have made a mistake. And then the more you grow and the more your skill set evolves you understand that no they've actually not made a mistake they've actually improved the translation um you know i think one of the most famous one of those and i got off the humor thing um but i still i do <laughs> i will say once again that humor is incredibly difficult for that reason but uh one of the most famous translations that really impacted me was um in a version of Final Fantasy where the translator Alexander Smith had, had taken the word where in Japanese it said, thank you. And he had rendered it in English as I love you because that was what the person was actually saying in emotion. They weren't doing the Japanese because Japanese people don't say I love you. They never will come up to you and be like, you know what, I love you, man. You know, Or even like look at each other and say I love you. So they say I love you in very different ways. Um, 
whereas Americans are not as subtle about that. And so it really just like showed me and then like inspired me to understand that, uh, how you can take braver choices with your translation to make sure that those emotions are getting across, not simply just word swapping because translation as an art form is very different than word swapping. Yeah, that's the difference yeah. between translation and interpretation and sort of, you know, the difference between gloss language and diction language mm -hmm. or that, you know, there's that, that depth of space between, you know, the direct verbal, it's, it, it's why sign language has no nuance because mm -hmm. it's not a language yeah. for translation. It's a language for interpretation. Sure. And yep. it sounds like a good translator always interprets. Yes. And yes, absolutely. Um, and even then you also realize like one of the things you realize is that a good, you know, not just a good translator, but you are good at things and bad at things, right? I am bad at comedy. I realized that when I did it, I am bad at it. So, um, you know, just like any, because translation is essentially writing. So just like some writers are really good at horror and some writers are good at comedy and some writers are good at personal interactions. Like I suck at comedy. And so I don't translate com comedic manga anymore because I realize I just don't have it. But other people are really good at it. And I am envious of their skills. You know, I'm better at other stuff. I think I have it like I think one of my biggest strengths is doing dialogue. I think, you know, I have a good strength of really putting out natural dialogue. And so I really am good at sort of human emotion stuff. Um, give me two people having a conversation about love and I'm all over that. I'm great at that, um, Or, uh, but give me jokes and I will kind of die <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, and I'm also pretty good at horror because I've had, you know, I've had a lot of experience with horror, but yeah, we all have our strengths. We have, and some other what, people that are really good at comedy, they won't find it as hard as I am, as hard at it as I do because they mm -hmm. have sort of a natural aptitude for it, I think. But still on a basic level, yeah, it is far more difficult, far, far, far. In fact, people tried for years to produce um, these, what they call these yonkomi, which are these comic strips that are very popular in Japan. They're basically little four panel strips. Like if you think of an old newspaper cartoon or something like that, mm -hmm. like peanuts or something like that, you know, they're four panel gag strips and they simply do not translate well. And so they were a <laughs> failure essentially because <laughs> they just don't translate. Interesting. Um, well, speaking of how language inter uh, gets interpreted and how we and how we learn about things, can you talk a little bit about how the the back matter on these issues was created? These like glossaries oh, yeah. of yeah, and like how were they chosen? How they come together? Who was so, involved? I mean, that was that was all me. Um, that was yes. basically like when I and I've been doing this for years for books. Um, so I just one of the things that people find when they hire me on a book is I always want to do more than you actually hire me for and that's just people have to accept that and it's fine um I the first time I did the yokai files I did them for and this was actually to serve a very specific purpose well first off I'll say that by my great love Mizuki Shigeto he did these yokai comics and he would always do these yokai files in the back that's what they're called in Japanese yokai fire and um, I just love them. I think they're great. I think they added so much to the reading experience. So when I started translating uh, Kitaro for Drawn and Quarterly, um, I wanted to replicate that. I was like, can we do yokai files in the back? And they were a little uncertain about it, but I talked them into it and we did it. And it was great. And, you know, like the first reviews were like, oh, we really like the yokai files. I like them because they serve a couple of dual purposes. Like I loathe translator notes I absolutely hate them I hate them so much I feel that if I have to put a translator note that I have failed as a translator because the original did not have notes at the bottom like the original was a flowing thing that you read through and so the artist did not intend for the reader to stop every few pages to read a little note at the bottom right that was not so so if I put a translator note I'm failing the artist's intent um, is sort of how I view it I, I've not done my job so what I would do is I would then like, but I, one of the ways that I make up for that is with back matter pieces, right? Because you can like write little back matter pieces on various yokai and things like that. And that way you don't have to put in little translator notes throughout the thing. Um, and so I did that on Kitaro. And then the next comic that I did, well, I talked about earlier with Sub is I did uh, Wayward. And so one of the first things when Jim hired me on Wayward, I'm like, can I do yokai files? He's like, sure, why not? It's, you know, it's our own little book. We could do whatever we want here. There's no one to tell us we can't. Um, and that was also a funny thing because Jim like actually, because we didn't know each other. I mean, now Jim and I are very good friends, but when, uh, when we first met, 
you know, we didn't know each other at all. We'd only just communicated by email. And he's like, I'd like to hire you for one issue to do this one thing. And I was like, that's an excellent thing. I will take your offer to work on this series for the entirety of it. And I will also do all of these other things too. So, um, <laughs> so I did the Yokai Files for Wayward. And then when it came to Demon Days, I was like, well, can we do Yokai Files? You know, can we do it? Like, can we add a little back matter into it? And, you know, Lindsay, our editor, was fine with it. And Peach thought it was a great idea. And Peach loved it, too, because it got her the, gave her the chance to draw the traditional version of the Yokai. So she really liked that a lot. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So, yeah, the Yokai Files are just pretty much they was something I brought to it because I thought it would be fun. It's, they actually, like, they every... Marvel comic I didn't know this at the time but they have like a certain overage page count that you can use if you want to and if you don't use it they fill it in with house ads and so I was like well I'm going to steal your house ad space and put in yokai files nice. Nice. nice yeah yeah but I love those I mean they just you know it was just an idea I had and and it's been so great working with our editor and our team at Marvel because I don't think they've ever said no to an idea. I mean, it's just been absolute bliss, you know? And I think also part of it was because it was a book that was just not really on anyone's radar. I mean, when Peach and I were first putting it out, it was expected to be, you know, who knows? We thought it was probably just going to not do anything. It was just going to go out. It was just going to flip and maybe no one would care. I mean, you can't really tell in the modern comics market until it gets into people's hands if people would like this little oddball thing. And also non-continuity books tend to not be popular. You know, people don't care because it doesn't matter what happens in them, right? Um, and so, so they let us get away with a lot more than maybe they would have with a normal book because we were just so off everyone's radar that we were allowed to do everything. And it was just great. Um, and I mean, I've like, even like the Yokai Files, like I've always loved things like that. I think that actually modern comics really uh, miss out on those old opportunities. Cause like when I would read the X-Men, you know, in my day, or even like, they always used to have the backup character profiles and things like that, you know, and they'd usually have a guest artist do it. And they were so cool. You know, I just, and those also always encouraged me to want to read other things where you like, you know, first appearance, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I got to check that out, you know? So that's just also my old school comics love coming in. But I mean, it was like, I, yeah, I assume we're much more on people's radar now than we were when we first started, but it's too late. So <laughs> people like us. <laughs> nice. I do want to say I bought the first volume of Wayward a while ago. Oh, awesome. And it's been on my list to mm -hmm. read. And I'm ashamed that I haven't read it yet. And I'm going to move it back up because I love Jim Zubs. And yeah. I saw that and I was like, I've never read this. I need uh, to read it. Yeah, it's, so. a, it's a magnificent series. I really love it. And I didn't know you were on there. So now I'm like, I even, because I didn't like look at all the, I haven't read it yet. So I didn't look at all the credits. And I was like, ah, oh, now I need to read even more. Yep, you do. You do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Wayward super fun. And Jim's like, I mean, I don't know. That's that's one of the other things where I talk about like with networking is like once again, find people that are your level that are coming up with yourselves because you know, then you get to have this circle of friends for I mean, I actually I play role playing games with Jim every uh every Wednesday night on Zoom. We've got a we've got a comic <laughs> creator um role playing club that we that's that amazing. We play with. Yeah, it's that's, that is everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that so much. Yeah, it's super fun. Ack into zoom <laughs> start I, with sub i know we're i know we're running close on time or over i don't even know anymore yeah um, no but... i mean i don't i'm not too bothered about time so like I, I don't know if you guys will edit it to cut it down and i assume you will or just let it run as it is either way it's fine with me but yeah if you're probably just gonna let it run just let it run just there it is there it goes I, I just wanted to ask this one question. I ask every mm -hmm. person that I'm, I'm able to interview um, if, and it's a real basic question, but I'm mm -hmm. the basic person. Um, <laughs> if, <laughs> since you're at Marvel now and mm -hmm. you said you like want to write more of just like your own stories and love all these mm -hmm. like more off brand kind, type of characters. If they could give you a choice of one of your like favorite, like kind of quote unquote off brand type of characters, which one would you want? Oh, geez, that's a tough question. Uh, especially with Marvel characters specifically. So, uh, you know, my favorite Marvel character is Kitty Pride, and I don't know that I would write her very well, um, but <laughs> she is my absolute favorite. Um, I think if I really got to pick what I like, but she's hardly off brand anymore. 
But I think if I could pick one person, and this was a character, I don't even know if he's in current continuity or not, because that's how far I'm out of it. But uh, this one of my favorite characters as a kid, he only appeared in three issues, but he was Cal Rankin the Mimic. And I absolutely mm. love, <laughs> I love so. the Mimic so much. So, so Mimic came back. He came back. Oh, yeah? And then he died again. And then okay. he came back again. And then uh-huh. he died again. And yeah. then he came back again as part of a thing called the Dark X-Men. And he worked with okay. Mystique. And that was cool. Yeah. And yeah. now I think he's just sort of limboing around. But okay, okay. Mimic, Mimic's a yep. motherfucker. I'm with you. Yeah, I love Mimic. Mimic was always one of my favorites. Yeah. So ask me some X-Men questions. Come on, bring on some X-Men questions. Okay, well right. then, <laughs> it's X-Men time. Um, you know, you oh, said that you stopped t- around 300, right? I, I, I'm guessing. I think I let it go for a long time because I had a pull box and I, I got, they started piling up and I realized I just wasn't even reading them anymore, you know? And it was just like, I was buying them out of habit because I have an almost unbroken run of X-Men 1 through whenever I stopped, right? So um, probably around 300 and random number like 347 or something like that i forget exactly what it was okay. but yeah then magneto good uh, guy or bad guy uh, oh that's a quick see i like magneto much better as a bad guy i think oh, that oh yeah no i, 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 kind, over. Of, I, I kind of agree i do <laughs> i love magneto as um as a sort of like sympathetic bad guy but i still want him to be bad right what's like i good love guy him. what's that tortured no, good no, no, guy no 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 <laughs> magneto is a bad guy all right. absolutely all the yeah all the way like my you know my favorite magneto is just yeah someone who you you respect but is still at the end of the day magneto's got to be evil magneto would kill people who stood in his way if he thought it was the right thing to do that's oh, i agree with that. yeah 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 i i have to agree i feel like like the excellent fan that was probably going to come for me but i exactly agree i've always liked magneto when he was more like kind of like a doom type character mm-hmm. where like everyone respected him but like no one wanted to approach him because he's so powerful and knowledgeable mm-hmm. and everything yeah, almost like, you know, almost like a fan of the opera type guy, too, you know, where he's just like, you know, he's immensely powerful yes. and terrifying and, you know, yeah. But like, I love like his, you know, his uh, issue. I mean, this is getting really old, but like, that's all I know. But like his X-Men 150, like around those runs, like the whole Magneto and the Savage Land part, I absolutely love. Um, I think I just think he's Shacking a better villain. Lee Merriweather. Right. That's good stuff. And I think that it that that's an unfortunate part when you've got a really classic villain. The idea is to then you know eventually they become a good guy, and then you got to find a new villain. And the new villain is often a mediocre substitute. I have to say, you know, when you find a good villain, let them be a villain. <laughs> I have. Uh, oh no, wait, Jonah. You yeah. Don't. Oh, I would love to know if you have a least favorite X Men member. <laughs> oh God, uh, my least favorite X Men, and I will say one of the ones that really just made and I. I'm going to offend someone because that's the way it works with X-Men, you know, like, yes, you know, <laughs> there's no way to talk See, X-Men somebody without, someone I like. Yeah, without absolutely getting someone pissed off. But um, it would be Maggot. Like, I just absolutely hated <laughs> Maggot. Oh, <laughs> oh, my God. A lot of people don't like oh. him, so I understand. Maggot I, was so Nico, bad. Nico likes him. <laughs> I like Maggot, too. I think, oh. but you, Joffin but is Zach amazing. Has, no, no, but Zach hasn't read Maggot in a long time. No, Maggot's I come yeah. far. Okay. Maggot's and come and far. who was the who was the woman who pulled the bones out of her body? Marrow. Marrow. Okay. Marrow. That was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I hated them. Oh, they are so much. far. Th- <laughs> I love gossip about people I don't know. <laughs> Meryl's come farther too, but she's not my favorite. But she has come mm. farther. If yeah. my question would be, if you could, like, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna mm. say five. Yep. If you could pick an X Men team, like mm-hmm. the team you want oh, on yeah. the X Men team, five members, I'll make it easy. Oh, Who would you pick? God, that's tough. I know I've, I've actually answered the same question on Twitter and it like killed me because I had to like figure it out forever and just like oh god I mean because like there's my classic X-Men who are to me are always like the X-Men and like I have like like Kitty Pride and Colossus are just my two favorites I just love them you know they were the ones that I grew up with and you know absolutely adore so they get to go on there uh then I would have Nightcrawler on because he's probably my third favorite because he's awesome 
Nice. Yeah. And I want to say the mimic also, except for there would he would have no one to mimic, so he kind of sucked. You know, he kind of works better with a broader team. Um, I mean, for the guys they're one? fighting, he can just mimic whoever they're fighting. Yeah, you know, yeah, and he yeah. can be like, "I'm the Scarlet Witch now, eyelash. I'm the Scarlet yeah, Witch right. now. Your hair falls out." <laughs> and I think you know, as as non exciting as it is, because he's a character that I don't really. I don't really love Solo, but I love him on a team with on the X-Men would be Wolverine. Because I think Wolverine mm. as a member of the X-Men is just, I think he's a great X-Men. I don't really like, I hate him as an Avenger. Like to this day, I refuse to believe that either Spider-Man or X or Wolverine are Avengers. That just offends me. Like they just shouldn't be. <laughs> I know, right? I know, I get that. Yeah, I just, it just offends me. It's like Spider-Man and Wolverine are not Avengers. They can't be Avengers. They're never Avengers. I just um, don't accept it in terms of time dilation. There's <laughs> something so uncomfortable about the idea that nothing can happen without these two white guys looming in the background. Like, I mean, see that I'm that I'm okay with. Like, I under like you know, uh, like one of the worst things I think with with comics is that, and this goes into sort of like comic theory is that. Um, I believe that when you attempt to impose rules on a fantasy world, it destroys the fantasy world. Like when you think logically about it, like, well, how can Captain America and Natasha have fought in World War II? And then like, and then, and then they're still here in 2021. Like as soon as you start to try to solve that problem, you, you destroy it. There's no way. The, the only thing you can do is like, um, I'm, you know, once again, not a big fan. I'm not a huge fan of his writing personally is Grant Morrison. Um, he just, but he wrote that he has this theory that I love called Batman's tires, the Batmobile's tires. And I always use this as my theory of comics, which is that he says, like, you know, the problem with adults is that they ask too many questions, you know, and he's had this theory, you know, he's talking about this. He's like, you know, like when, when a child sees the Little Mermaid, they don't ask how Sebastian the Crab can sing and dance. Um, but adults see that and then they start asking questions like, well, the crabs went underwater an awfully long time and this is an air breather and why are they down there? And so they kind of ruin the magic, right? And they, adults do the same thing with comics. They're like, adults will look at the Batmobile and they'll see, they'll go, who puts air in the tires? Who pumps the air in the tires of the Batmobile? And the Grant Morrison response is, Nobody, you goddamn idiot. It's a comic. <laughs> Just accept that the Batmobile's tires are always inflated and have fun with it, you know? Stop trying to... So that's how I feel about the time dilation effect. Like, does it work? No, but we can all just forget about that because it's fun and it's it's enjoyable, you know. Like I, to me, continuity and like that kind of stuff is just the, is the death of joy when it comes to superhero universes. And that's something that Kurt Busiek has said too that I also agree with a lot is that he's like said comics are grand opera. You know, they they are there on a larger scale. And when you remove, especially super, well, specifically superhero comics, but when you start to remove that, like when you start to say like, well, this person's costume needs to be practical. It needs to look like something that they would actually wear. I'm like, but does it, you know? I mean, does it really? <laughs> um, because when you go to like Kabuki theater or something, or if you go to like opera, you know, something which if you've ever been to opera, I mean, their costumes are absolutely not functional, you know, not in the slightest. You know, but yeah. if you're sitting and in the those audience, costume changes are a bitch. Let me yeah, 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 I know, right? <laughs> but they're amazing, and that's part of the spectacle. And if you're in the audience and sitting there, you know, and you know, Sigrid comes out, and you're like, well, she certainly wouldn't go into war in those shoes, you know. And like, if that's your thought process, then maybe you're enjoying the wrong form of entertainment because the splendor is to me part of the joy, you know. So I love the ridiculousness. Like, that's why I love like the 80s superhero costumes. Like, you know, <laughs> give me Wolverine with a ludicrous mask that when he takes off, his hair is the mask. Like, just give yes. me that stuff all day long. <laughs> and I am so awesome. Like, give me- Eric give me, the Red uh, and his you know, red licorice bondage. Oh my God, so good. So good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Colossus with his giant shoulders and his circus tent yes. outfit. I mean, I, just, I love stuff like that all day long. He I'm looks like Glenn when, Close um, trying to run for Princess of the Future. It is the most <laughs> unbelievable look in retrospect. It is. <laughs> I'm thinking of when Steve Rogers was running around as Nomad and he had the deep V. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the black. Yeah. No reason. That was amazing. Or I Black Goliath, that. who has the ab window on his the chest. ab window. Like it's, <laughs> it's Power Girl's boob window. But, but on the men ab. Want it. Well, oh. gay men, but where men yeah. want it. <laughs> I guess I just. <laughs> 
you know. It's all, yeah, no, it's all good. It's I a mean, rich hey, tapestry. I, yes, it is. And I love that kind of stuff. You know, I just love the sort of the silliness and the over top of it all. And, you know, like to me, that's my expert. And that's kind of the reason why I've fallen out of favor. Like I tried reading, um, you know, Hawks Fox when it came out. And I just can't get into it because Hickman is just, you know, I'm sure he's brilliant, but he's really, he's more head than heart, as I like to think of him. You know, he's more like really esoteric and into ideas. Whereas I'm not particularly into ideas. I'd rather see the X-Men play baseball and, you know, just do <laughs> stuff like that. Like, that's the stuff that I absolutely love. You know, I want, I want, you know, shy kisses behind plants and, a, you know, an occasional handhold and, you know, just like all that sort of like just innocent sweetness is what I absolutely adore. I feel like I'm in the middle of that. Like I want the, the baseballness, but I also want the next page to be all the graphics and the charts and like the, the percentages and like, what is this and that? I'm like, I love all that stuff. I just want a mixture of everything together. Totally. Well, and, <laughs> and like I said, I think, honestly, I think that's why we're in the golden age of comics because you actually do get it all. And that's the best thing is that we have an immense buffet of options of which you can select. And if you're, you know, and, and not only that, but not only in the comics out now, but we have more access to older comics than ever in the history of comics. Oh, so yeah. Find the era that appeals to you and read that era. And, you know, and if this current era doesn't appeal to your current run, there's still lots and lots of good stuff there, you know. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully some of that old aspect of it, because I think Demon Days also sort of suits that, you know, there's a sort of like innocence to it and a sort of like just you know, emotionalness to it that I think that we also is something we bring. And it's nice to see that readers are still responding to that. Well, I can't think of a better thing to go out on. Zach, this was the most <laughs> amazing interview. Thank you for all of these amazing inside <laughs> stories and for this amount of process and understanding of not just what the book is, but how the book gets made, which makes me feel like I can appreciate it even more. Now, I, our audience needs to know where they can find you because I'm sure everybody's going to mm -hmm. want to follow you after they get to hear this. So where can everybody find you online? So um, I'm very vain. And so everything is just my name. So Zach Davison at Twitter, Twitter is just at Zach Davison website is Zach Davison.com. Um, it's pretty easy to find me. So that's about it. Yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, and you guys are going to love curse web. Oh, it is so good. I just, I wish we could get it in people's hands right now. The waiting is really hard because, and when you read, Curse Web, I, there's going to be a couple of scenes where you're like, oh, now I know what he was talking about. I cannot <laughs> wait. And I know our no audience way. can. And until then, you guys can pick up, what, is it on printing 74? And are there 96 covers of each issue oh at this my point? God. It, is, it is insane. Yeah, it is crazy, crazy, crazy. So guys, please go out and support Zach and Peach and Ariana's amazing vision for a very different take on the X-Men because I can tell you this team is obsessed with it. And guys, until next time, check out more amazing content here on X's for Podcast. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> Hey guys, if you like that cut from X's for Podcast, you'll be sure to like some of our other materials. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out these other amazing videos here at X's for Podcast.